Right. Well, I'm absolutely delighted to be looking at Kelly J in what in a fantastic studio. Hello, Kelly. How are you doing? Yeah, good morning. I'm great. Thanks for having me. Oh, no, thank you for coming on the show. Um, I've been following you for quite some time now. I've had lots of um, guests on the show to talk about the topic we're going to talk about today, including Billboard, Chris, and lots of people from the US um, and the UK. But um, I'm absolutely delighted that you'd come on the Freeman Report and talk about what we're going to talk about today. Um, now, I have to ask the question. We did talk about it in the break slightly there. You've got a Christmas tree behind you. It's not even December yet, okay. Kelly. Well, look, my family, we've had ours up, including all of our hallways and everything decorated since the beginning of November. So as soon as Halloween was over, my studio transformed into a winter wonderland. <laughs> and it looks fantastic, by the way. Right. Um, Kelly, um, what I like to do with my guests and um, before we talk about the topic is just to understand them a bit. Um, you especially, I mean, you are a fierce character you're certainly not scared to put your head above the parapet which i totally respect um but i'd like to learn a little bit more about you what kind of your what was your upbringing like did you have any role models um is there anybody kind of that have in, influenced you into becoming the person that you are oh i i do get asked this often and i feel so awful because i i don't know whether i do have specific role models i think i um was in in awe of Christopher Hitchens, um, you know, somebody who can just speak so eloquently and really damning, you know, just totally finish somebody off, uh, which I truly admired about him. And also at all about Peter Hitchens as well, just as a, a polite etiquette to um, eating somebody uh, for breakfast, which I thoroughly enjoy. <laughs> um, but apart from that, look, I was a little girl that went around with boys um, I think I think some of that has carried forward that the ease in which I can say to somebody something that is true, but not necessarily nice. And I don't mean that I would go out of my way to be mean. I just I just think sometimes I would rather speak in one short, concise, uh, meaningful sentence than a whole heap of waffle. So I think that little bit I was I was sort of into going on stage and, and so I'm quite confident. I don't particularly mind attention if it's uh, negative or positive uh, none of those things bother me and I think um, actually I think I'm really comfortable in my own skin and I think that's also something that a lot of women don't like very much uh, they don't like other women that are really comfortable in their own skin because it projects that that they're not so it's those little things I've got an older sister I, I grew up in a working class house, household I had 21st cousins um you know what can I say? My cousin's here actually today fixing my kitchen. So um yeah, it's, it's a well it, look, it's a big, robust, working class, proper, accountable childhood, which I think is something that working class do really well. You are pretty much accountable because everyone has to sort of pitch in and there's no there's there's no sort of um flowery language to pretend that something is or isn't happening. Now, you've been speaking out. Um, I was actually quite surprised because I came across you probably the last 18 months. But you've been speaking out on this issue for, for quite some time now. And I've seen even uh, videos going back as far as 2018. So, you know, half a decade ago. What was what was it that first made you speak out? Was it a deliberate thing that you thought, no, I'm not having this? Or, you know, did it just happen slowly? What What, what actually triggered you in the first place to start speaking out? Well, it was the 2015 election um, and I was on the left. I definitely would have been a Labour voter, had been my whole adult life. Um, and just didn't imagine the Conservatives would have won an outright majority. And so I, like other women, joined this sort of ineffective um, online group uh, called, either called Amazing or Awesome Lefty Women, right? And it was, <laughs> looking back, it was hilarious. but. Um, Suddenly, so I joined when it was about 400, and I think the membership was about 20,000. And it just started getting populated by blokes in dresses, basically men that look like they should be driving trucks for a living, men in their sort of 50s and 60s in makeup that was, you know, they just looked like they'd run into a makeup factory. Um, so it was, um, it was just interesting. And I think 
more than just those men being allowed to be in that space was the fawning of the women in yeah. that space about how brave these men were, how ma- amazing their eye maker was. And I think at that point, I just thought, oh, so- something's up. And then when I tried to talk about it in this particular group, I was just met with vitriol and, and um, you know, a- accusing me of being transphobic, which is something I'd never even heard the term before. Um, and then I learned that actually these men weren't transsexuals at all. They were transvestites, and yet they wanted to have our language, and women were happy to give it. And once I knew I couldn't talk about it, then that's all I wanted to talk about. And fast forward into sort of trying to talk about it in lefty groups and being told. My question was, does my 11-year-old daughter have the right to use a female-only space and not see an adult penis? And the answer was swiftly, no, you're raising a bigot. Your daughter's a transphobe. She must be a pervert. Why is she looking at people's genitals? And then that, you know, that's it. And then you're the, then you're what I would call peak trans, which means that you've got to the very top of the peak of how insane everything is. And there's no really looking back. I guess it's like a female version of a red pill. So would you say then, I mean, I'm a, I'm a parent. I've got two young children, 10 and 14. For me, I think this is what makes me have a personal concern about what's going on rather than it just being sort of a, a general interest in terms of from a political point of view. Um, mm. Is So would you say, is that the thing that really sparked you and said, absolutely no way, um, I'm not having this and I'm going to speak out? Well, look, to be honest, when I first realised what was happening, I had no idea that we were transitioning children. I had no idea that it was going on in schools. In fact, my oldest is uh, 21 and my youngest is 15. I've got four children and it wasn't in schools. Like, So when I peaked, it wasn't in schools. Um, I know about three years after I peaked, somebody, one of the dinner ladies at one of my kids' schools said, oh, we're not allowed to use the word boys and girls anymore. I was a bit like, mm, that's quite odd. Um, and another woman I knew was running some, uh, she was sort of the chief nurse for community nursing of the Southwest. And she was having to rewrite their guidance. So that was back in probably 2017. Um, so I think you go on a fast, you go on a fast learning curve. As soon as you understand what's going on, you then begin to realize. And and every time you're like, well, that, don't be so ridiculous. That That's not going to happen. They're not going to pretend they're female. Um, and it just gets worse and worse. And so... Um, what they are doing in schools is absolutely atrocious. I went into a school a couple of weeks ago and recorded the conversation actually for everybody to hear. And it was, it was, uh, teachers lying to parents' faces, um, trying to evade questions, um, knowing that they're in the wrong. So, so imagine this. We have the conversation where we sort of, the, the questions go, uh, along the lines of, you know, what are you teaching? Uh, what about girls' autonomy? There were no female toilets in this primary school. There were no female toilets. If they went on a residential, there was no automatic right to a girl to have a female-only bedroom on that trip, and they wouldn't even have to tell you. Um, They were reading grooming literature to children, including something called the Red Crayon, which is about Mm -hmm. gender identity wrapped up in crayon nonsense um, and all this stuff, but but bare-faced lying to parents. Um, And at the end of it, so I was, you know, I was relatively strong. I wasn't impolite. I did ask one of the women to not roll her eyes because I felt it was rude. But they um, they, they just sort of answered like politicians. And then at the end of it, the parent actually got a letter to say that the staff members for being questioned were visibly shaken and un- unable to attend meetings for the rest of the day. I mean, this is this is teachers who are quite happy to tell children off and force children to lie are then uh, sort of emotionally unstable and infant-like when challenged. So, you know, of course, it's personal for most of us, uh, but I think it's not just the kids that are transitioned or so-called transitions, mutilated, lied to, um, and and some, you know, believe that maybe there is a male body waiting for them at the end of their female childhood. Not just those, it's what happens to an entire generation of children that are brought up on the basis that they cannot tell uh, the truth about the things that they see and know to be true in front of them. They have to lie, otherwise they risk being punished. And I think that's a that's a societal harm that I think will will bear the most dreadful fruit as we as we move along. Yeah, and I've had people on um, from the US where it really is a problem. You know, you're talking about there's a whole industry in some states of children having operations and 
um, puberty blockers. You know all of this stuff, but it really is yeah. shocking, um, some of the guests and what we've heard here right here on the show. But Kelly, one of the questions that always fascinates me is where all of this has come from, because when you look at um, people that are uh, gender dysphoria, um, you know, if you look at the ONS figures, for example, from the last um, census, it's about 0.5 percent and there's you know question marks even over that number whether it's been inflated so we're talking about um a mon a very very marginal group of society who genuinely have this condition and yet you know we can see the trans lobby it's very very powerful there's huge amounts of money behind it um you know they've managed to lobby get in there with governments um that you know one of the questions that always fascinates me is what's behind all this? Why are we seeing this? If this is such a small marginal group, why is this in the mainstream? What do you think is behind this? Well, there's a number of things, I'm afraid. There's money to be made, so that's always a driving force in anything. Um, there are uh, doctors and uh, medics who fancy themselves as uh, God. Um, there are governments that are very weak there are campaign groups that need funding um so that they will for example at the moment if you if you uh, run a lesbian organization in a country like south africa where there has been corrective rape of lesbians if you're running a lesbian organization in order to get money from international ngos you have to accept that men can also be lesbians so there's that driving force there's a lot of do-gooders there's a lot of incompetent people um and there's there's a hell of a lot of evil so I think the combination of all of those things, like those teachers in that room, they weren't evil, they weren't profiteering, they weren't, mm. uh, they they stood nothing to gain apart from social currency, which I think is another issue, uh, predominantly for women, but also for men on the left. So uh, less alpha males, if you like, um, also have some of this conditioning, although they use nice as a strategy rather than a quality. Um, so it's those two teachers, they weren't bad people. They 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 really weren't. They were just weak, incompetent and and uh, a little bit stupid so they're they're okay to go along with it and i don't actually think that they should be free from accountability because even if you're you know if you go along with something on the basis that it saves your job but actually it puts kids in danger then i'm afraid uh, there is no free pass for for those people but when you've got <clears throat> an industry creating billions of dollars of money um, even the Chelsea and Westminster Hospital in the UK is going to open to do 260 phalloplasties, which is fake penises for women, a year. Um, and I think that's on NHS money. So many themes um, and not enough people standing up against it. It always is still I, I understand everything you're saying there, because one of the things that Bill Bill Chris said, for example, when he was on the show that you've got all these massive organizations like Stonewall and and really they've become obsolete now because the whole gay rights thing, which which kicked all that off. Um, well, we've got gay marriage now, you know, it's 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 there's nothing to see here now. There's nothing to do. And yet these organizations are there um and you know they need funding they need a um, um something to do in in the world but even um taking that into account there is huge money behind this um do you think there are um nefarious reasons why we're seeing this happen now and like i said the money flowing into this other than just the fact that there is an industry there now Look, there's always look, power corrupts, doesn't it? I mean, it's an old adage, but I'm, I'm afraid it's true that, that when you get into a particular place of wealth, um, you think that you have power that, well, you do have power to change things. So if you are persuaded, so Biden, for example, Joe Biden, his son, uh, the one who died, was really good friends with um, a man who's one of the most rabid trans activists in the United States. He's now a, a senator. So all you need for to corrupt some of these people is you just need a few sob stories and for them to think it's their next big civil rights action. So of, of course, there's, there's always nefarious people, but the most nefarious people will be those men who are obsessed with becoming women um, who have billions of dollars. Um, you know, they're, they probably have the most malicious intent. And then they can pull certain strings. But I, I do think there's many forces 
there's there's people who you know stonewall maybe their their funds did run out and they thought this was the next way of making money and i i think that's what happens when you have charity that becomes big business it's always it's always going to go like that it's you know the, these stories are as old as time it's not like it's a brand new thing that somebody i don't think there's someone sat in an evil lair saying hey how can i fundamentally ruin society but i do think that they maybe don't have enough people around them to tell them that it's exactly what's happening and they don't have anyone with a firm enough no because governments have lost their teeth in so many areas and and corporations large corporations seem to have more of an influence on society than many of us would like yeah now you've you've traveled around the world and i applaud you for for doing this but you've put yourself at great risk um certainly your trip to new zealand and i'm sure that you probably get lots of death threats and all sorts of um issues um with from the trans activists which are very very aggressive what would you say is the the point where you've been most worried um about your personal safety i genuinely did think i was going to lose my life in new zealand like like not not all maybe but i thought that i i just envisaged myself hitting the floor and never getting back up and that's not necessarily because people genuinely wanted me dead although i do think there were a fair few that did but just the uh the chaos of a mob um can lead to some pretty terrifying outcomes and i, I just thought i was going to hit the floor and never get up so i was quite frightened that whole thing i then had to go into armed protection until i left the country I had an armed escort through the airport. Um, in fact, the armed escort stayed at the airport, um, making sure that nobody else got through the gate until my plane had taken off. So I think that was quite scary. Um, but, you know, th there's there's been many an incident that women have been hurt by trans activists. And I think over the last few weeks, the way that we've seen policing, I think should really make us all worried. And I don't care what side of the debate you're on, of any of the debates, whether you're pro or or against uh, whoever is being treated better or worse by the police. But we should all be worried when the police are not uh, treating every single citizen of, uh, of this country in an equal way. And I certainly have felt that women who attend my meetings, well, some of them don't come to the meetings because they're so worried about the trans activists and the trans activists have intimidated women. They've threatened women. They've made us feel alarmed and distressed. And yet they were never told to go home. They were never arrested and they certainly have never been told not to come. So I think, you know, that in, in that respect, I'm a little more fearful of this country as a whole over the last few weeks. Um, but yeah, but, but my life is, is, um, New Zealand was the place. Yeah, it did look fairly scary. Now, listen, um, I'm going to I think I know the answer to this question because it's I've got a follow up question on it. But have you ever thought about, do you know what? I've got a family. I've, you've said you've got children. This is all getting too much now. Um, I, I really should just knock it on the head. Have you ever seriously considered doing that? No, I'll tell you I'll tell you why as well, because I am the only person in this space and I include the men and the women. But women, we have a totally different idea about what is going on. We have a totally different perspective. And I'm speaking to women because I am a woman. I'm not speaking for women. I'm, I'm speaking to women in the hope that women speak up for themselves. And there's no really, there's nobody else uh, that's actually doing that. So I, I don't really have a choice but to give up. But also, um, I frequently say on my podcast, I never lose, and I, and I really don't. And this is not this is not going to be the time where I find out that I might be wrong about that. And in terms of your, you know, your your approach, it seems like I mean, it just just from an obs outside observer, that being provocative is part of your strategy, getting in their faces and the trans activists because they're out there spreading their message and pushing their ideology on us. Is that something that is deliberate for you to um, to actually bring the issue to the forefront? Or is that just you? Is that just what Kelly J is like? Well, look, unlike other activists, I don't go marching into the middle of a crowd and hoping I get punched. I don't go and try and provoke anybody, actually. All I do is just try and get women to speak. The fact that it's provocative is a, is a byproduct and is something I think everybody should understand that women just wanting to gather and speak 
is considered provocative, which is just nuts uh, that we live in a society in which that is considered provocative. So, you know, I'm I'm really not. I don't. I've been invited before to go and try and talk in pride marches or try. And, I'm I'm not interested in doing that. I'm interested in letting women speak. That's that's simply what I do. Exactly what it says on the tin. Um, so if that is provocative, that is just indicative of where we are. But um, yeah, it's. I don't try and get in their faces. I go and stand still in a place, and they try to come and get in mine. Uh, so it's it's. It's an interesting difference that sometimes people don't quite understand, but there is a difference between me saying, look, I'm going to go in as my legal right. I'm going to go and stand in this place and I'm going to have, I mean, I've got to have at least two close protection bodyguards everywhere I go uh, because my life is is permanently sort of under threat and, and of assault or if not worse. So um, I say I'm going to go and talk here. I invite other women to come and talk. And then the trans activists behave as they behave, but it it's it can't be considered provocative uh, just for going to do that, even though they are provoked. That's a very different thing than saying, "Hey, there's a group of trans activists meeting. I'm going to go over there and I'm going to provoke them into a confrontation, so I can show everyone on the internet what bad people they are." Because that, I'm not interested in doing that. I'm not interested in. There are other groups that that are quite happy to put women's lives at risk. I'm not happy to do that. Uh, we always get security. We always have really good plans uh, for women's safety. I'm not, and I also never attend anywhere without ensuring that the police are actually in attendance. Now, New Zealand was different because they were in attendance. I just didn't realise they weren't actually in attendance in the right place. So it's a really subtle difference, but it's a very important one. Yeah, and I was thinking more. And listen, I'm not I'm not attacking you here. I, I applaud <laughs> everything that you're doing, Kelly. Um, but I, I was thinking more of the billboards. Um, obviously, you know, and again, I think you're probably gonna argue the same thing because you put build you paid for billboards to go up in Liverpool, didn't you? That had um woman and it had the definition, the dictionary definition of a woman. Um, some people, I guess, would say that that's provocative. It's trying to sort of get out in people's faces. What mm. would you say to that? Because in the end, they had to be taken well, that, down, <laughs> didn't they? Well, that of course, yeah, look, that was provocative. What that was supposed to do, what I thought in my, you know, that was back in 2018. I thought, I'm going to put this billboard up. Trans activists are going to go nuts. And everyone else is going to go, oh, my God, why are they going nuts? Oh, job done. Oh, my goodness, that woman is right. We can't even talk about what a woman is. Isn't she marvellous? Um, game over. Well, of course, they're not women. I thought that was kind of, <laughs> I was so naive. I thought that was that was going to be the thing. <laughs> and it wasn't, but it was supposed to provoke the unreasonable into an unreasonable position, into sort of revealing their unreasonable position. So that was provocative. But, you know, it, it, but the other thing is, I don't think it's provocative. I know it will provoke, but I don't think it in itself is a provocative act. However, I the the main reason to put I did the I Heart JK Rowling uh, billboards up in uh, Waverley Station in Edinburgh, and I did the dictionary definition of the word woman in Liverpool, and they were they were supposed to generate response. And you know, like I said, I applaud you for that because I think one of the problems with this whole topic is many women and men actually avoid it like the play because they can see the vitriol and and you know and 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 all of the hate that seems to, to to be focused around this whole debate and so people avoid it so no well done you for doing that and you know for stimulating that debate right now kelly um you gave the answer i expected you know have you ever considered stopping i don't think you are <laughs> you are definitely fierce you've got loads of courage and you've now set up a political party tell us all about that well, what we've noticed is there's there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of women asking politicians to help, and they've been the conservatives who are like the closest. They've they've been in charge for the last uh, goodness knows how long, eight years, and they've they've just watched over this ideology take hold of all of our institutions. So I just thought, well, what can we do? And and I've what I've done with let women speak is that I've raised awareness and I've created enough stories now that the public is 
fully aware of what's going on. And I think I've pay, played no small part in that. Uh, so the next logical step is actually to take power. And it's not just about members of parliament, actually. It's where the, the really direct power is, which is in local councils. So I think uh, if we look at any sort of movement that has managed to change the landscape, uh, they are going for local councils. So, for example, when um, somebody's deciding on whether or not they're going to build a uh, gender neutral unisex toilets in the town centre with a new toilet block or it, the the local theatre whether it's going to have male and female toilets or going to switch to unisex which actually are really unsafe for women then I want a woman to be involved in that conversation you know a member of party of women to be involved in that conversation I want people who are prepared to say hang on a minute what on earth are you doing um, and we want the PCCs, we want any elected uh, sort of government position, local or national. These are the sort of places we're going for. Um, and it's just, a, it's just, I just want someone in that conversation who is the more abrasive kind of woman at the school gates, which is like, what are you talking about? Why would you do that? Like, what about the women? Like, why the our elderly women don't want a bloke in their home to come and do intimate care? Or, um, you know, elderly women don't want to share their hospital wards. So different people in positions like that, like one of the things we do at Let Women Speak is we advocate for women. So we go along and accompany women on hospital visits or um, housing sort of association meetings, or school meetings where they want to have somebody next to them so they have the courage to demand the rights that they know that they should have when it comes to single sex provisions. Now, I, I definitely do think I agree with you that we do need some strong voices in our political system, in local government and in national government, because I just find it really odd that we've ended up in the situation we are where um, people are actually pretending that men can be women. And we've got, you know, men in women's sports, men in women's spaces. I find it incredible that we've managed to get this far where it seems to have spread throughout our society. But I guess my question for you is that for most people, though, um, the majority of people, this is a um, maybe a number five, a number four issue. Obviously, the economy is always a big issue um, um, in politics and there are other issues as well. What what other policies or are you just going to be a party that stands on these issues? Have you got any other policies that you'll be standing behind? Well, look, as a woman in this country, every single thing is related to my sex. Right. So if we look at economy, we know that that poverty and certain policies impact men and women differently. Um, female uh, centered groups or feminist groups would say that women are adverse, more adversely affected. I would not definitely not stand on a policy of like women have it worse, but I would definitely like to understand how men and women are are impacted on a different level. So when it comes to policing, for example, many women, more than men, have been um, interviewed by the police uh, on this particular issue. I think, um, you know, being female and having a sex-based recognition uh, is important in every aspect of society. And what's really interesting for women is that when we look at any other civil rights, uh, not women's rights, but if we look at any other rights, like the fact that people marched for uh, the BLM was because it impacted black men as well as black women. If it was just black women, if we wanted to talk about the worst impact of what happens to women in America, black women in America, we'd be talking about domestic violence. We wouldn't be talking about the racist society. We'd be talking about the fact that they are three times as likely as a white woman to be killed in their own home. So when it comes to any other sort of fight for rights, women don't fight for themselves very often. They're quite happy to fight for other rights, which include men, which, you know, it's fair enough because we're we're part of the human race. Right. But I think being female and actually when it comes to schools, I think a lot of people will fight for their children. And I think about four fifths of the population are parents. So I think a lot of people will care when they understand that this is just the tip of the iceberg. These, this pronoun stuff is simply the tip of the iceberg when it comes to what's happening in schools. But yeah, we have policies in other areas, but this is our main thing. We're not, 
I'm not hoping to be prime minister tomorrow or next week, you know, maybe maybe a decade. Uh, but I'm not hoping to be prime minister next week. Um, this is about unifying women and having a unifying voice on some single issues. Think of us a little bit like UKIP. You know, we left the European Union on the basis of one man almost, on the basis of Nigel Farage, because he stuck to one issue and he wasn't sidetracked. And I, I really think that that um, anyone in any political realm uh, needs to take all the good lessons from from the things that he did. Well, again, I applaud you for doing this. And um, are you going to have men standing in the party as well? Of course, as a party trying to get registered in this country, we will invite anybody to stand. It just has to be the best candidate. Just had to be someone speaking uh, our language, really, which is very, very <laughs> truthful and tight. Um, so, yeah, it would be men or women. Fantastic. Well, listen, um, Kelly J, we have sadly run out of time. Thank you so much for coming um, on the Freeman Report with me today. Where do people that are interested, um, very, very quickly, we've got about 20 seconds, where do people okay. go to hear um, um, what you're up to? So letwomenspeak.org or you can find me on YouTube, Kelly J Keen. Fantastic. And I definitely recommend Turf Talk as well, which you can find on all leading um, uh, video streaming platforms. Kelly J, thank you so much. Um, you'll have to come back on the Thanks. show again and tell me all about your political fight that you're um, up for now. 